At the end of the Obama administration, the Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mavis, met a lofty fleet size goal that's being pursued to this day. In this week's Actionable Intelligence, Defense News' Aaron Mehta speaks to Naval Warfare reporter David Larder about why and how the Navy is moving to a 355 ship fleet. All right, well, Dave, thanks for joining us to talk about the Navy. I know it's something you hate doing. Uh, look, one of the biggest things with the Navy is dealing with the question of fleet size. This is an ancient issue, uh, but it's kind of taken on extra energy the last couple of years. Walk us through how we got to the point where a 355 ship Navy is a legal requirement from Congress. So during the Obama administration, the Navy had come down from its post-Cold War high of about 600 ships to just under 280. Uh, and that turned out to be way too few ships. And the reason they got there is they had started trading um, the number of ships that they had or capacity uh, to fulfill the missions that they were given for high-end capabilities. And when we were the only Navy on Earth, that worked, right? So we didn't really need a high-end next-generation cruiser. It was too expensive. We didn't really need this stealth destroyer. It had a mission that we did not think we needed anymore. But we did uh, need to sort of keep going with the Arleigh Burke class destroyer, which focuses on air defense, so defending the aircraft carrier, and ballistic missile defense. And so over the years, we traded away, uh, you know, a lot of the low end ships that we'd had, frigates, uh, the conventional destroyers that didn't have the, the Aegis combat system. And we would used that to invest in, you know, the, these high end capabilities, you know, the Seawolf submarine followed by the Virginia class submarine. Um, that became unsustainable. Uh, and it became very clear it was unsustainable in the Obama administration um, when the Navy was being pushed well beyond its its current limits and capacity. They had ships going out on nine, 10 month deployments um, and the maintenance cycles were broken. These ships need to go out, deploy, come back and then go into deep maintenance like any car or any machinery that it needs to be worked on and needs to be fixed, needs to be maintained change the oil, the whole nine yards um, before it goes back out. We got way behind on that. Um, so the push at the end of the Obama administration was to really boost the fleet's numbers to start meeting the demand that is placed on the Navy for day-to-day -day presence. Uh, so on his way out the door, Mavis put down a 355-ship um, Navy plan. Uh, Trump had actually run on a 350-ship Navy. And uh, they obviously embraced that. Congress was excited about it. So they put it in a National Defense Authorization Act that that is how many ships the Navy must have. One of the things that's been interesting about the Trump administration over its four years was how involved at the highest levels uh, the president or national security advisors were getting involved in actual numbers like this. The 355 ship Navy was like a, a big deal for the national security advisors and for Trump himself. He said it, it was mentioned on uh, the campaign trail. It's pretty unusual, isn't it? It is. Trump really saw this through the lens of jobs. And I'm not trying to say that he was trying to steer contracts to certain places. But what I am saying is he viewed these things as jobs. I think the Pentagon started getting there as well. They really saw this as a, a strategic pivot towards sea power. Um, and that is a different type of diplomacy and a different type of projection than what we'd been doing recently, right? So big land wars in Asia had been our main sort of form of power projection. The Trump administration ideologically did not like that. They wanted to end endless wars as they sort of harped on endlessly. And the pivot was we can't just retreat from the world, but we don't want troops committed all over the world in these big land conflicts that cost an enormous amount of money. The reason sea power is attractive is you kind of uh, meld the two, right? You get to hire lots of people and create lots of jobs building ships and in key battleground states that you want to win in elections, and you get to project power overseas. And that was kind of the one-two punch that was very attractive to the Trump administration. And we're talking about sea power projection. Of course, we're talking about the Pacific. Everything's about China right now. I want to take you to yes. quickly to Mark Esper, the former Secretary of Defense. He actually put together a plan uh, which called for something like over 500 ships. Uh, some of those would be manned, some of those unmanned. Now that uh, Esper is gone from the, the administration itself is gone uh, with the Biden team coming in, what do you think happens to that 500 plus ship plan? 
Right. So it was always a rhetorical uh, 500 ship Navy. I don't think anyone would count, um, you know, a kind of single purpose unmanned vessel that just goes out into a choke point to do ASW uh, as a ship per se. This past year was a bad year for their unmanned plans. Congress smashed it, uh, (laughs) smashed their plans into little pieces and told them to sweep up and come back with another one, essentially. Uh, Part of that is this large unmanned surface vessel which was designed to hold missiles and kind of tag along like that faithful wingman with the, with other ships with maybe, you know, larger capacity, this would act as an external missile magazine. Congress didn't like that. So basically what they're going to do this year is do a whole year study of how else can we put missile magazines in the fleet? Should we do that on commercial vessels that we've repurposed? Should we do that? Uh, by throwing them on military sea lift command ships, which has some Geneva Convention sort of downsides to it. Um, but uh, th- th- so this year, as we get into the 2021, the Na- that's what the Navy is going to be thinking about. How do we get unmanned into the fleet? How do we boost the number of missiles that we have in the fleet to combat what is now the largest Navy in the world? And that's China. All right, well, we got to leave it there. Dave, thanks for joining us. Actionable Intelligence. As always, you can find more about these stories at defensenews.com. Thank you, Aaron. And now for defense industry headlines. The Biden administration has indefinitely paused two precision guided munition sales to Saudi Arabia worth as much as $760 million as part of a new policy aimed at curtailing violence in Yemen. However, that policy, announced by President Joe Biden, left the possibility open for future sales that are considered vital for Saudi Arabia's national defense. A fine line that would mean some munition sales will continue. The two deals include a foreign military sales case for 3,000 Boeing-made GBU-39 small diameter bombs, which was cleared by the State Department in late December with an estimated price tag of $290 million. That's according to two sources familiar with the matter. The second is a direct commercial sale for Raytheon Technologies Munitions, likely the reported $478 million sale of 7,000 Paveway 4 smart bombs. The U.S. Department of Defense announced that it awarded a $231.8 million contract to LMUSA to pump up production of its COVID-19 home test for use in the United States. The effort will allow LM to increase its production capacity to 640 tests per day by the end of the year. Elium's test was the first fully at-home test to receive Federal Drug Administration emergency use authorization for people with or without symptoms. The test is performed with a nasal swab and results are displayed on an app in about 15 minutes. The French DGA procurement agency announced on Monday that France will acquire its first joint tactical signals intelligence system from Thales and Airbus. Second systems gather intelligence from such sources as enemy radio or radar. The new systems will modernize and complete the current tactical SIGINT capabilities, taking into consideration new communication technologies used by adversaries. It'll also standardize the systems across France's military services. The $193 million contract was signed on December 31st. Early capabilities of the new system will be delivered in 2023 and is expected to have full capabilities by 2025. And that's it for headlines in the defense world. When we come back, we'll hear about the Biden administration's pick for VA secretary and get an interview with a groundbreaking woman fighter pilot. And later, analysis of the top news of the week from the Military Times team of journalists and editors.